six years old the first time I went to rehab. A lot of people don't realise there's rehab centres for kids, but I promise you there are. Most of them have pretty sweet playgrounds and an endless supply of Milo in the dining hall. Now, of course, although after that talk I'm wishing I was a six-year-old jacked up on cocaine, but no, of course I wasn't. I was there because my mother was an alcoholic and my sister and I were able to live with her in child-friendly rehab centres. We stayed in a lot of places like that as kids and we started to think of them as a lot like camp. There were other kids for us to play with and our parents weren't drunk, it was amazing. Uh, for the adults, it wasn't really like camp because it meant they weren't taking all the things that made them feel really good and also made them act really crazy at home. For our mum, the thing that made her feel really good was wine, which when kids compare things the way they do, my sister and I realised was actually really low on the scale of cool stuff you can be in rehab for. Like, there were all these other kids saying that their parents were there because they couldn't stop taking things like heroin, which sounded so impressive to us, because <laughs> trust our mum to be in rehab for the lamest thing ever, which was wine and usually in a box. <laughs> Always in a box. <laughs> I had learned to read a couple years earlier when I was about four or five, so like most of the other rehab kids, I knew the serenity prayer off by heart. The words meant nothing to me, but I just learned it by rote because you'd see it on posters in the communal bathrooms and every tired looking adult around you was chanting it under their breath 50 times a day like, while they're mopping the floor, like, God grant me the serenity. And you know, when they're in the dinner line and I push in and get the last bit of pudding, <laughs> courage to change the things I can, wisdom to know the difference, chanting in a circle, lots of circle chanting. I was told the words were important. I knew that they helped people get off things like heroin or like my mum off wine in a box. So I knew that the words were powerful, but I didn't understand what that meant. How could words have power? How could words be magic? How could the babysitter, Babysitter's Club book I'd been reading be powerful? How could, you know, the word serenity on the poster on the back of the toilet door be powerful? I was six, I just didn't really understand that concept until I accidentally one day harnessed the power. So it all seemed fairly innocuous to me. I thought the serenity prayer was dumb, mainly because I didn't really understand what serenity meant. So I wrote my mum a poem after school one day, came home to our little cabin in the rehab centre, I wish I could remember what the poem said. I can't remember the exact words, but I know it was about six lines long and it mentioned the words, don't give up, several times. And I rhymed up with something and I tried so hard for this talk to remember what it was, but I don't know what I would have rhymed up with. <laughs> like, I was cup or sup, but I, I can't remember. I read the poem to my mum and she burst into tears. And then our cabin mate, this woman who never wore shoes and lots of hippie skirts, she came back to the cabin and my mum read it to her and she burst into tears. And then my mum asked me if I would read it at her group that night where they do the circle chanting, so I did. And when I read it to them, the same thing happened. They all burst into tears, 12 of them sitting in a circle all holding hands and crying and beaming at me by the time I got to my last cheesy never give up. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I mean, this was a room full of people who don't like to feel anything, and because they numb all the bad stuff, they never feel the good stuff. I mean, this is a room full of people who literally put poison into their bodies just to feel a tinge of happiness, and I just made them all cry with joy using words. And I looked down at my piece of paper, and then I looked back up at this crying group of people in front of me and I was bewildered and, and bemused and then I looked back down at my piece of paper and I thought, I think I'm a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at least what I just did seemed magic. It was the first time I realised not only the power that words have, but how powerful you can feel from using them as a tool, a tool to engage people, move people, entertain people. For the first time in my 
chaotic, tiny little six years of a life filled with drunk parents and a schizophrenic dad and empty houses and foster families, a feeling of anxiety permanently in the pit of my stomach, for the first time in all of that, I felt like I had some power. I'd never had control over anything. And at that moment, standing in a room full of 12 addicts, I realized that I had control over words. Suddenly I realized that everything around me that I loved had been written down by somebody. Every episode of The Simpsons that I watched, every Babysitter's Club book that I read, somebody had used words to write those. Writing was an actual job that you could have. Writing allowed you to tell whatever stories you wanted. You got to be the boss of something in your life. You had the power to create something from nothing. I could take a blank page and fill it with words and suddenly be in control of my entire narrative, of any narrative. You can forgive me for thinking as a six-year-old kid who's been dragged around to 10 different rehab centers that I may have been a wizard. <laughs> so that's when I decided, not long after a room full of grown men and women cried while I stood bewildered in front of them, that I decided words were going to be my magic power. No matter what life was going to put me through, no matter what dark hole of a rehab center it was going to send me to, I was going to write my way out of it. Every time we got home from rehab and my mum went straight to the fridge to open a box of wine, Rosie, write your way out of it. Every time we were taken away with 10 minutes to pack a bag, write your way out of it. Every time my parents did something crazy or humiliating or heartbreaking, I'd think, keep it up, you guys, because I am clocking all of this. <laughs> <laughs> and I know how to write my story down now, so I'm going to write my way out of this. I became obsessed with storytelling, but mostly I think because of the darkness I'd been exposed to at that age, I became obsessed with making everything funny. I would record episodes of Seinfeld and Roseanne on VHS and then pause it and play it and painstakingly transcribe all the dialogue into a little notebook. And I wrote epic plays that parodied soap operas and performed them in the lounge room of whatever house I happened to be living in. And I found a tape recorder and I started recording a satirical news radio show without even really understanding what satire meant. I just knew that if you did news stories that weren't actually meant to be news, it was kind of funny. I mean, I was figuring out what irony was, what hyperbole was. I was figuring out what a three-act structure was, and I was just feeling my way through it. I was figuring out that entertaining people and engaging people and moving people, that's what would save me. Words are what would save me. And they always, always, always have. Words became the ladder that I used to climb out of a very dark hole of a childhood, and it's the ladder that I still use to climb out of things today, whether I'm writing my story or imagining another, whether I'm writing books or television, which I do now, much to my six-year-old self's total joy, or columns or recaps of The Bachelor. <laughs> Words <laughs> are what saved me. Words gave me power when I had none, and learning to harness that power, however accidentally, as a six-year-old in a rehab center who thought she was a wizard, completely changed my life. And so when I'm asked, as I often am, as the token Hauso foster kid, what advice I would give to kids who are trying to survive the same kind of childhood that I did, or what advice I would give to anybody who feels like they are in a position of complete powerlessness, I just tell them, write your way out of it. Start a diary and get some, some control over your own narrative. Or write a play that moves people to tears or a skit that leaves them in hysterical laughter. Write a Facebook post about something you care about or tweet a fucking fart joke. Just however you decide to use words, they can be your magic power. Because no matter how powerless you feel, you can always take a blank page and fill it with whatever you want. You will always have the power to create something. So take that blank page, do what six-year-old Wizard Rosie did, and write your way out of it. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.